All right, welcome back, everybody. I'm going to be honest. It took 20 minutes to get this fucking studio set up. I don't know what Taylor's doing. They we're in a new studio with different angles. Lauren's doing selfies, distracting me. This whole thing's very frustrating. I might be flustered on this episode. It might not work out the way we all wanted to. Also, it's worth noting that this is a redo episode because Lauren tried to do this whole birth, pregnancy, postpartum story the last time we were in Texas, like right after. And it was a total shit show. We sat for 45 minutes. It was a total disaster. I scrapped the whole episode. I hope it never surfaces. It was completely useless. So welcome back to the show. I was just a little fuzzy postpartum and anyone who has been postpartum can understand. I, I was a little slow. <laughs> Fuzzy's not the word to describe. I felt like I was talking to a wall. I felt like I was a wall. I'm back though. I'm back. I had some coffee. I had some minerals. I had some water. I had my pink drink from Erewhon. I'm feeling buzzy. I'm good. Lauren wants to do this like post-birth episode talking about you know, that experience. But what I thought when the first time was that it was so all over the place and so confusing, even talking about me giving cookies to nurse and nobody cares about that stuff. What we want to know is one, how it all transpired, the experience, and then now what we're doing after to get ourselves back in the state of mind, in the shape, in the feeling that we all, that we're in now. I think that's the interesting episode. Perfect. That's the thing. It's supplements, it's wellness routines, it's practices. It's how we're basically bouncing into life with two new children or two children now instead of one. Okay, so this is like a strategy, a, a, a strategy session that you guys are hearing with me and Michael right now. Yeah, well, and it's also talking about what we've been doing since you're three months postpartum now. Three months postpartum. You can talk about the experience a little bit, but let's not go too deep. If you if you want that, maybe write into a journal entry or something. No, I am going to do a blog post on it, and there's also a highlight that says towns on my page all about my birth story. We can do a little. People aren't going to be as hyped the second time around because they're like, we get it. You got yeah. the kids, right? Like, don't, now people are going to get mad, but it's true. It's like the first one, there's right, bells the and one. whistles and rainbows and gifts. And the second it's one's like, like, we get it. You got kids. Yeah, the first one's like the princess or the prince. And the second one's like, yeah. <laughs> Sorry if you're a second child. Four towns. Okay. So, no. So, let's just give a little context of my birth story to, to kick it off. Um, I was taken to the hospital by Michael, who didn't know where he was going. I knew exactly where I was going. I got there at an incredible time. And we decided to go in at five o'clock in the morning, which was fun. We got in there. We got all set up. I got the epidural, which is wonderful. They gave me a COVID test that was the most uncomfortable thing in the entire world. That was that the COVID test that they gave me in the hospital was more uncomfortable than giving birth. Can we talk about the absurdity of all this now? First of all, you know, it was wild. And like, listen, not to, you know, I didn't have to get the test. They they assumed that if you had it, then I would have it. Then but why? It, I have to squeeze the fucking baby out of my vagina and you don't have to get a test. It's I, wild. You know, everyone's had to do all these COVID tests for the last years. Thank God those things are done. I think they're done. At least I'm not doing it. I'm opting out. I, I'm opted out. I'm not doing it anymore. After they shoved a six, like, foot thing up my nose that hit my brain and literally gave me brain damage. Taylor, I, this was something out of Alien versus Predators. Taylor, you don't understand what they shoved up my nose. I was like, what the fuck is happening? And then I go, does he need one? And the, and the nurse says no. Wait, I saw her do this COVID. And, and listen, these poor nurses, they were saying like they have to do them and sometimes they bleed. And like, it's just like this. It's enough. Like it's just gone on and on. And I feel so bad for the people that are working these establishments and these hospitals that have to do this stuff all the time. Because it's listen, guys, we're not talking about the little one that like swabs your nostril a little bit and tickles you on the inside. It was eight feet. This one, I saw this go into your fucking brain. I saw it like I couldn't believe that it even, felt like a dildo was being shoved up my nostril. I could not believe how far they could get this thing up in your head. And the only thing I could think selfishly, especially you're going through birth. I was thinking to myself, holy shit, I don't think I can do that. I don't think they're going to be able to do that to me. And the best part was afterwards, she goes, OK, I'm going to do the other nostril. And I said, no, 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 I'm not. Do I'm not doing that. I'm not doing the other nostril. No, thank you. And she said, OK, well, you can opt out. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me that in the beginning? So then I said, well, why doesn't my husband have to get one? I opted out from the beginning. I was like, fuck yeah, but no. Why doesn't the husband have to get a COVID test? I wish they could shove the thing up your asshole so you guys had to get some kind of pain. Honestly, the between the brain and the asshole, the asshole looked like it might have been easier. Okay, so the COVID test was like the most eventful thing out of the whole thing. That's, that hurt the most out of everything. My epidural did stop working, which was fun. Well, it didn't stop working. We just... the the. The, the bag, we forgot to get it refilled. <laughs> I was on bag duty. I got a little distracted and then I could try to get catch up with it. Yeah, you got really distracted. So the epidural stopped working, which was which was great. But still, that was less painful than the COVID test, which was interesting. Um, Michael decided to order all this food and eat it in front of me, 
That was another fun thing. You can't really eat. I, I was having some lollipops, though. Now that I could speak freely on the COVID, I mean, God, that COVID stuff was such <laughs> horseshit the whole time, right? God, thank God we never fucking got into all that shit. I mean, sorry about everybody, but like, God, like all these things, the test, the thing over, it's like, you got it, you, <sighs> you, you know, you got it, you got it. And by the way, my thing is, is like, people are going to be grabbing a baby out of my vagina with all these juices, like what's <laughs> and blood, like, and shit or whatever they didn't shit. Yourself. I didn't shit. Okay, okay. Just you know, I didn't shit myself. Just checking. Okay, you wanted you wanted to see if you wanted to give a test. Yeah, I, I wasn't too deep down no. there. I did not let Michael go anywhere near my vagina. He was behind my head, which was super nice. Same game plan as the first time. Same game plan. My thing is like we did it well. If we got through it the first no, time, like, let's not change it up. No, Only no. thing that was changed up this time was I was basically the doula because I learned from. Which the first time. this is what this this is what I would recommend. I had a doula my first time because I didn't know what was happening. But the second time, I felt like it was it would be interesting to have just you and I in the room. And I'm really glad that I did it the second time like that. I think if you have a husband though that is like watching the football game and falling asleep, maybe get a doula. Like if you were doing that, I would want a doula. But you're so maternal sometimes. You turned it on. You're awake. You're asking me what I need. You la- allowed me to be your punchy bag. You're you're not going to take this in because you're no, you're no. embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed. I okay. feel good. Thank you for the compliment. Yeah. I, here's for the husbands out there, if, or the the significant others, or the men that are you know procreating with the women. If they're listening right now, turn this part up. I think the first time it was extremely valuable, and I'm very grateful for the experience of having a doula because we didn't know what the fuck was going on, and we didn't know what we were doing, and I needed a little coaching, and so did you, and it was nice to have somebody that had that level of experience and calmness because we had never been it, been through it before. The second time, it's not that I don't think doulas are valuable. I think they they very much are, but we felt confident as a couple that we could go into that experience and that we could both h- handle our parts. Obviously, my part being the much smaller part of just being the support system, but didn't feel like we needed the second time because we had been through it and we're second time parents. But the first time, like I wouldn't change the experience for the life of me. I, I didn't want to have to manage anyone else's energy. You're enough. And so I knew all the things that Andre, my doula from Zaza did. She wanted oils. We had like little tea light candles. We put frequencies on five to eight Hertz. Um, and we dimmed the lights and we just made it like a sanctuary in there. I had these strawberry candies, these nostalgic strawberry candies that like your grandma probably had in there that I could suck on. I love something to suck on. And I was able to set the room and the vibe. And Andre helped me do that with Zaza. But I think the second time I knew what I was doing. If you are wanting a doula and you're in L.A., definitely check out our episode with um, Zaza's doula. And that's Andre. Andre Lemon. She's incredible. But this time there was no doula. You were the doula. Yeah. So I'm taking applications now. Okay. You were you were you are great in labor though. I mean, you're a little obnoxious. You had to do a sheet mask. You were ice rolling and checking my stats, but like you that was entertaining, so it was fine. Well, it's a lot of downtime, you know. It's a lot of down. Oh, that must be so hard for you. I know guys that bring on like full on like Xbox and in PlayStation in there. So give me no, God forbid I'm doing a sheet mask. You were watching you were watching like Better Call Saul. No, Ted Lasso. Yeah, so don't Shout out for that plug, Ted Lasso. Not like you need my help, but you know, great show. Um, so, so I think that it, if you're gonna give birth, maybe do, try it with a doula the first time and the second time. I, if I was to do it a third time, which we're not even discussing at this moment. Ready again? <laughs> I can't do the condoms, Lauren. I'm sorry. I, it's it's too it's too much. It's like putting a bag on your head and doing push-ups. Okay. Well, I got my period six weeks after I gave birth, and the fact. You're ready that to go I can again. get pregnant six weeks after I gave birth is really overwhelming. You're fertile again, huh? <sighs> That's how I'm gonna smell the pheromones. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get all heated up in the studio. No. Taylor, so, get out of here. Get out of the studio now. Every morning without fail, Zaza says vitamins. And I honestly cannot believe how easy it was to get her to ask me for vitamins. And and I really attribute that to Haya Health, okay? So at first, I didn't want to give her children's vitamins because they're basically candy in disguise. They have so many chemicals and just junky shit in them. And I'm like, this defeats the purpose. But then I discovered Haya. And this is a pediatrician approved super powered chewable vitamin. I tried one and it's so good. But the difference is Haya is made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk. You know, the gummy junk, you know what I'm talking about. And it's perfect for picky eaters. So specifically, I wanted to start giving Zaza vitamin D and B12. And this one not only has both of those, they also have 15 essential vitamins and minerals, zinc, folate. They have stuff 
for energy, brain, mood, concentration, teeth, bones. They really cover all their bases. And so I actually ask Zaza like every morning, I'm like, what color do you want? Do you want green? Do you want yellow or pink? And she gets to pick her color. And I say only Uno. She only gets one and she just loves it. And it's become a ritual for something healthy. You should also know, and this is really important to me, is that their chewable vitamins are non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. So they just really did their research and I'm about it. We've worked out a special deal with Haya for you. It's for their best selling children's vitamin, the one that Zaza takes. You receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com. This deal is not available on the regular website, you guys. So you have to go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H.com slash skinny and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. So... During the time I was giving birth, it was fine until the epidural stopped working. And then it became really, really intense. And it was time to push. And my doctor got there, Dr. Amanda Holly, amazing doctor. Incredible. Yeah. I had a, a great experience. And Towns was born in like 10 minutes, I feel like. It was Popped quick. out quick. It was quick. Big 9.3 pound baby. I was like, whoa. Towns took 10 minutes to come out. And my theory of it is, you know, the baby has to come out. So I'm going to give it everything I fucking can as quickly and efficiently as possible to get the baby out. So with all my strength, I pushed him out. And he was so cute when he came out. He went right on my chest. We did skin to skin. Him and Michael did skin to skin. I love the moment in the hospital too, after you give birth, when it's just you and your husband or your significant other and the baby. It's a really special time. And everybody coming in with all the IVs and stuff. No, 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 no. I don't love the IVs. I was like, get this out of my arm. You can opt out of the IVs too. Yeah. Okay. Well, now I'm I'm opting out of a lot of things. That's the biggest thing you learn in childbirth is like there's the hospital recommendations and then there's the things that you want to do. And you might have to sign some forms as you opt out of certain things, but like you still get to make the choices. People have to remember that. Like, yeah, you do. You have you, to be your own advocate. In yes, there. you do have to be your own advocate. I we we did have some incredible nurses. I always recommend getting cookies for the nurses. I it's it's an important thing. The nurses deserve cookies. They're working their asses off. Um, but I, it, the, the picking and the prodding and everything when you're trying to relax is a real bitch because sleep is so healing. And after you give birth, all you want to do is sleep and then they just keep waking you up. But we had a really nice time in the hospital. Very simple. I would say my birth was a 10 out of 10. What yeah. would you rate it? I mean, yeah, 10 out of 10. I yeah. had it fine for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. <laughs> fine, for, fine for me. I can't, this can't, can't. motherfucker brought a sleep mask, iPads, sheet mask his own ice roller, a sleeping bag, a stuffed pillow with like down feathers in okay. it, a silk pillowcase, so, toe stretchers. So it was absurd. Here's a weird thing that I think people do. I, I never understand when people feel like I have to share their experience. So let me explain. I can go, <laughs> I can go into that setting and be comfortable as well in my, in that setting. Why do I have to also be in a situation like, don't you want me energized and relaxed and calm and comfortable so that when it comes to the important stuff that I can jump in and get it done? Of course, I don't want to lay on that shitty hospital cot. Sorry. It's not like these things are four seasons. They're not putting like the great beds for the husband. They have these things that they fold together like erector sets and then you lay on it. And no thing. one gives a fuck about the husband's feelings. Yeah, I understand. So what I'm saying is like these guys, like people are like, oh, my husband was just going with a little sheet. I'm like, yeah, he'd be miserable and freezing all the time. I had a nice sleeping bag. I had all my supplements. I had all my foods. I had prepared. And so when it came time to go time, the reason I was able to perform for you is because I was in the zone. And I was relaxed. Tell them what you did before we got in the car. I don't know. 430 in the morning. What did I do? What are you talking about? I have no idea. You cold plunged. Oh, that is true. <laughs> I, I knew it was go time and we were going. This is how you know this is my husband, though. I've you didn't even know what a cold plunge was. Like I went in the ice ago. bath because I knew I was like, I got to pump myself up. I got to get into the flow state. I got to get going. So I get the cold plunge going. I was all jammed up, all ready to go. And then boom, I was able to get the job done. Why are you acting like you're the one that gave birth? Well, why is this strange? I guarantee you if I had a bunch, if, if you had a bunch of these wellness people on that we have on the show and they're like, what did you do? I was like, well, I brought proper supplements and proper sleep things. And I brought, I did a cold plunge and I got everything organized. They'd be like, damn, primed himself up. Like why just sluggishly go in there with like, I'm all about self-care. You're talking to the wrong audience. I'm skincare. all about it. Yeah. Do your, do your thing. But you were, I just noticed that as you've been with me, you've gotten more and more anal and specific about your stuff. I almost brought my own IV guy there with us too. Maybe hit a little NAD while I'm going. Okay. Joking aside. 
talking about the stuff. I feel like becoming a parent is a pivotal moment when you realize that there's a greater reason to take care of yourself outside of your own interests. Meaning, I think about my health and wellness now personally, I don't know how you feel, is not only do I have a responsibility to take care of myself and be the best version of myself, but now I have to be there for my children, my wife, and I have to be in optimal shape and condition to handle what the life of what the life of parenting throws your way. So like, for example, I'm usually the one that has to carry a bunch of stuff. So I want to be really strong. I want to be able to pick up my daughter and my son and not have a struggle with it. I want to be able to carry all the strollers and the bags. I want to be able to deal with all that stuff. So I, I need to get strong and I need to have endurance. I also want to make sure that I'm, you know, in the right mindset. So I want to be t- all of these things. And I feel like that I, I always like taking care of myself, but that unlock having kids has accelerated my movement towards health and wellness way faster than any other event in my life. I don't think your wife has anything to do with it. No, of course. But I'm saying don't. And and I feel like with you too, like we've, we've completely altered the way that we operated since we've had children. So that's what I think the episode where I want to take a turn with this. And I want to give you guys some things and some tips that we've been doing that are little habits, tips, tricks that we've done since becoming parents. Because we have changed a lot of our life. And a big part of that is the move to Austin. What I've realized about Austin is it got us out of the chaos and the distraction. But I don't think it's just the move to Austin. I think just, and not everybody has the ability to do this and it doesn't have to be a full state or city, but just a move out of a, of your current environment once in a while. It's like a haircut. Or it's your like existing, cutting dead energy. Yeah, or your existing environment. It doesn't have to be like across state lines, but even like just changing environments once in a while. And with that change of environments, changing your routines. The problem is we get set in these routines and these same systems and these same processes when we're stuck in the same place for a long period of time. And I think like the move for us was like a full opportunity to completely question the entire way we were living. Yeah. And I think the distraction element's really important. If you're living somewhere and you're constantly distracting yourself with parties and events and and get togethers, it's it takes away, in my opinion, from you taking it to the next level. So to get out of LA was like a, a very it would cause me to focus on things like mindfulness and meditation and what kind of workouts I wanted to do. I feel like even when I come back here, we've been in San Diego for a little bit. Like it's things can get distracting sometimes. Well, and let's be honest, like, and this is not a knock on the previous generation, but a lot of our parents and people, our parents age, and I'm sure a lot of listeners here, they have this mindset where you plant down in one place and then you stay there forever. You stay in the same house, you know, especially this time. Yeah, we talk about this a lot. You do the same things. You have the same group of friends. You live in the same city, you know, sometimes same career, same job. And I think sometimes that could feel very stagnant, right? You And it's, it's not to knock, but like, I think what this generation is pointing out is that you can move around, you can bounce around, you can change career paths. You don't have to live in the same place. You can get interested in different hobbies and different careers and, and, and taste different things in life. And so for, for us, Lauren and I always talk like, is Texas going to be the forever place? I don't know. But being able to have the flexibility to move and also like, again, now with children, also not getting in the mindset where it's like, well, we have children now. We have to be here forever. They have to go to school and have their friends. Like people move around. They adjust. I met Lauren in sixth grade. She bounced around to different schools. We had plenty of friends that did that. You know, it it happens all the time. It's not to say you're going to pull them out for forever. You don't, you don't want to like have them bouncing all the time, but just having the mentality that things may change and that you can change your environment in different times and different moments in your life, I think is important. Yeah. I also... I know this is weird. I love moving because it causes you to like clear things out and clear the space. And I think I'm I'm trying to be and live as minimalistic as possible instead of like having all this stuff and hoarding all this stuff with me. It just feels like dead weight. So th- when something about moving is like super cleansing. Anyway, so some tangible habits that people can pick up. I'll let you start kick it off. Well, I think the first thing and the parents out there will get this. When you have children, you quickly realize that you're no longer operating on your own time anymore. You have moments in your day that are yours that you carve out, but it's also based fully around what's going on with your family and your children and their schedules and when they're sleeping and when they're awake and when they have dinner and all of these things. It doesn't have to be so crazy. I mean, we don't get so crazy where there's like crazy nap schedules and we have to adhere to that, but it changes. And I th- And I think what I've found is We listened to so many parents that talked about the challenges of being a parent and trust me there are many but what i've what we always try to do is think about in a different way it's like okay 
knowing now that the time is going to be more limited and that we don't have all this free time, that's actually an opportunity to audit the time and say, okay, we're going to get really, really productive with the time we have. So if we know our child is waking up at 6.30 or 7, maybe you get it up and going. We just, we establish maybe there's a specific gym time now. There's a specific time for reading. You you create these blocks and windows for yourself where before when you felt like you had endless time to just kind of go about your day as you see fit, you're maybe not as regimented or as disciplined. So for me now, like when I get that moment to go to the gym, I'm all in. When I get that moment to read, I'm all in or cold plunge, whatever it is. So I think one of the benefits of having children is you get to be very disciplined with the time that you actually get to yourself. Yeah. Kersel Lim came on our podcast and said that she goes, I didn't realize how unproductive I was before I had children. You do have to, you do have to very much optimize the time that you have. When I think like there's two ways to look at it, because if you look at it the other way and say, okay, now I have children, I don't have any time for myself. I can't do anything. That could be really self-defeating because then you start to behave in those patterns and in those ways. I think you have to look at it from an abundance mindset, though, to be like, I don't have time. I can't do this because of children. I try to look at it like, okay, I need to be more creative with my time. Yeah. Well, the fact of the matter is, and some may not like hearing this, I've never been more productive and I've never been in better shape or healthier since I've had children. And my point is, is that I've because it's made me focus. I have to I, I have to take these moments now and utilize every second, every every minute to the best of my ability. Where before it's like, oh, okay, maybe I'll miss the gym or maybe I'll go here. Or maybe I'll have that. There's no real reason because you feel like you have endless time, especially for young people listening. I think something that's really helped me and I talked about this on Instagram story is habit stacking. And what what that means is I take it as a two-pronged approach. What it really means, it's by James Clear from Atomic Habits, is that you attach a healthy habit to something that you already do. So say you brush your teeth every day, you would attach tongue scraping to that. And then maybe you would attach flossing to that. And then maybe while you're doing that, you're listening to a podcast that's expanding your knowledge. Another way that I have it stack, and I don't know if this is technically the definition, but I do this all the time, is I'll take something that's super healthy that I'm doing and I'll add things to it. So like, for instance, when I meditate, like, can I lay on a PMF mat with fucking toe stretchers in and um, and a crystal eye mask on with a, maybe a sheet mask with my legs up on the wall to drain my legs? Like, I'll try to put little healthy habits in the habit that I'm doing. Um, you know, if maybe I'm driving somewhere, can I be listening to a podcast? Another great way to do it, and I talk about this one all the time, is if you have to take a lot of conference calls and you don't have to be on video, take a walk while you're doing it. Ryan Holiday taught me that, and that's such a good way to walk and move. So habit stacking, I think, is is an incredible way. And we've done that with the ice bath and the sauna. Like you attach the ice bath to the sauna. So you're getting two healthy habits in. It's a really great way to be productive with your time while learning another healthy habit. Yeah. And I think we were talking that like we have all the, when Lauren and I take long drives or we're traveling or doing something, we have these kind of like introspective conversations where we talk to each other about what's going on in our life and how we're thinking. So this episode may be a little different because a lot of it is talking out loud. It's like, I don't think we're sitting here actually giving like, this is step one. This is step two of the advice. It's more thinking. And, and, you know, many people got interested in my journey of staying sober, meaning like having no alcohol for almost, what was it? 166, 170 days, whatever it was. It was a long period of time. And that was really triggered again by having children. And the first thing that I told Lauren and thought about, I was like, okay, low hanging fruit. And every parent knows this. There is absolutely nothing fucking worse in the world than waking up hungover with a kid that is bright eyed and bushy tailed, ready to go asking for eggs and you're sitting Yeah, her there. latest is to go, eggs. And they don't Papa care. Papa eggs. Papa eggs. They don't care eggs. what you were doing the night before. Eggs. eggs. They don't care how you feel. Or she wants you to take her for a muffin. Yeah, they don't They don't give a shit what you are up to and if you're about to throw her. So you, like one, <laughs> escaping that. And then two, really like thinking about it a little bit further and saying like, okay, some of this behavior has to change because I don't want the example I'm setting for my children to be somebody that's running around drunk all the time, seeing that in a young Not, And listen, we still have party and we still have a fun, but it's like there's a it's time. It's a different it, way. It's 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 very specific now. It's like is this is this for a reason or is this just to go get drunk and get fucked up for no reason? I think like as you start to become older and and think about this kind of stuff and have children you start to really pick moments. And so when we go out now, I think we have a lot more fun because it's much more intentional as opposed to just being aimless. 
Yeah, I think I think everything's more intentional. Another thing that that Michael and I were talking about is how do we integrate our children into our life because we want to be around our children and we want them to be malleable and flexible. Um, and instead of like trying to always get away from them, we we were talking about how we see a lot of parents be like, oh, my God, I can't wait to have a break from my kids. I want to look at it from a different angle and see how we can integrate it. So like I'll work out in front of Zaza and, and when I'm meditating, I'll tell her what I'm doing and explain it. Um, or I'll make minerals with her in the morning and mix greens together and have her stir it. Like I really want to integrate her into the healthy habits and I think that that, that is, that's been working well for us. Michael said earlier that we have conversations on long car, car rides and we do that all the time. Whenever we're driving in the car, we tend to like try to put our phones away and just actually talk to each other. And I think that that's another sort of healthy, healthy habit that couples can do together is like actually having time to strategize and visualize what you want in the next chapter of your life or in the future. I think that's a really important foundation of a relationship and something that's worked well for us. Yeah, I think people, I mean, maybe people that are familiar with like with us now, I don't think people realize like how much conversation we have with each other about what we both want out of life. And and not just from a business perspective, but also from a relationship spec perspective, a family perspective, where we see ourselves living, living, where we see ourselves traveling. Like we spend a lot of time making sure that we're both aligned and w- where we're going. So many times in life, you you just go, go, go. And all of a sudden you, you're, in, you're in a relationship and you end up in a place where both people are looking at you like, how the fuck did we get here? And do we even like this? And so I think it's like, it's really important as a couple to sit back and be like, okay, this is what this is. Go, this is what's going on with this opportunity or this is what's going on with family. This is what we're doing here. And it in making sure that you're aligned in where the train is moving instead of just getting caught up on the tracks and all of a sudden looking around one day and be like, how the fuck did this happen? Yeah. And and the other day we were even talking about something and you said, okay, we're misaligned here. And you called you like called it out. You said we're misaligned. And that gave me an opportunity to step back and like be like, okay, how do we how do we get aligned on this this issue? I think that that talking about what you each want to each other all the time is really healthy because then you can each start to visualize your goals separately and together. And meditation, and I know I keep saying this to every everyone, has been like a strategy session with myself. It's made me more aware, more mindful, and to be able to take 30 minutes of my day and just think about how I want my day to go, think about how I want my week to go, think about how I want my life to go, has been so beneficial. I was explaining it to one of my guy friends that is very, very smart and very intelligent. And he just said, you know, I can only sit still for five minutes. It's really hard. And I told him, I said, think about it instead of like meditating or the word meditating, that it's a quiet strategy session with yourself for you to think and for you to strategize on your future. And when I said that, I could tell there was like a shift in his energy where he was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to change the way, reframe how I think about this. And he texted me the other day and he's like, I'm meditating every single day now. Well, so many people go through life thinking they can bend every aspect of life to their own will. Right. And I used to be one of those people where you think like you can, you can control your environment. You control what other people are doing. You can control what's going to happen and what children do. And again, not screaming on the rooftops for everybody to have children, even though I think that at some point people should, if they can, um, is that children teach you that you're, that you sometimes have to go more with the flow of life. That's what they taught me. And But at the same time, you can align on where you ultimately want your life to end up and then also be aligned that it's not. it may not be in the way you think you're going to get there. So for example, you and I will talk and I'll say something like we're misaligned. And what it'll do, it is, it'll get us both thinking about, okay, well, I thought I wanted to go this way and do this and you thought you want to go this way. But then we talk and say we're misaligned and it may completely change what I actually thought I wanted or what you actually thought you wanted. And then we meet in the middle and find something that together we actually both want, if that makes sense. And I think re- couples get in trouble in relationships because they don't actually talk about what they really want. And they just kind of go with what one of the more dominant partners wants. And all of a sudden they get there and there's this huge blowout because they've just kind of like, oh, you know, I'm supporting my spouse or I'm supporting my husband or my wife. And then it, you're just going along and doing things that you're not actually happy about. And so I think just aligning ahead of time and saying, this is really what I want out of life. It'll probably alter your partner's decision if you explain why you want that out of life. Other little things that you think have changed the game when it comes to wellness, because you have done a body transformation. 
I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time. I think everybody under the sun should lift weights. I think that it's one from a mind, like, I don't think a lot of people realize how much mindfulness goes into weightlifting, right? Like, I think you just think, oh, I'm just slamming a bunch of heavy weights. It's a real, like, would you disagree? It's a mind body connection. You have to have it. It 100% is. So it's meditative. It's totally meditative. And I also feel like it just burns fat. People get scared of muscle, and we've had different experts come on the show and talk about this. You want to build muscle so that when your body is sitting inactive, that it's also actively burning fat, right? So, or boosting your uh, your metabolism. You want to do these things. And so that obviously we're implementing, especially as we get older, a bunch of cardio, but not crazy, you know, hill sprints all the time, just, just cardio. Um, I think Lauren has been eating, you've been eating a lot more red meat because the first time you were so postpartum, and I think you know, I stayed out of it a lot the first time because who am I? I'm a man. I don't know what was going on. But after educating myself a little bit more, like in hindsight, you probably weren't lifting weights. You weren't getting the right exercise. You weren't supplementing the way you are now. And so that's been a huge change for you. I do want to shout this out because I think it's important. The first time that I was postpartum was a fucking nightmare. Like I look back on that, that it was probably the lowest time one of the lowest times you of could my probably life. go back and listen to episodes around that time and also even we got in some fights even on the show talking about the issue because it was like it was so jarring to both of us i was i think michael even has like micro trauma from how i was i had horrible postpartum depression i had invasive thoughts i had anxiety i felt unbalanced i felt the way that you feel when you're about to get in a car accident like all the time my nerves like my nerves were just shot and then there was all these other elements, like because I was so shot, like remember I broke out in that rash all over my entire face. I felt just so puffy, not in my body, inflamed. And looking back, there were so many things that I wasn't doing that I'm doing now. The first thing that I have to say that I can literally feel the shift in my hormones immediately is getting in an ice bath. I can, can I know that, listen, people are like, well, I don't have an ice bath. Okay, cold shower then. Freezing cold shower. Take take a bath that you have and get ice and put it in an ice bath. I'm telling you, you guys, two minutes in that ice bath, my hormones immediately feel balanced. I can't explain it. It's one of those things you just have to try, but it's absolutely incredible. And if you can't do that, do a cold shower. Um, that That is number one. Well, it's also because it puts you in that fight or flight and makes you focus on nothing but survival. Yes. And when I get out, it's like I can just feel my hormones go, ugh. Another thing, I've been so serious about my supplementation. I've really been doing a lot of fish oil. Fish oil has been an absolute game changer for me. And it's really good for puffiness and inflammation. And I'm doing every single day greens. I'm doing minerals. I'm, I'm really focusing on my multivitamin ritual. I'm doing, um, you know, chlorophyll, vitamin C. I'm really serious about my vitamins now and my minerals. And for minerals, I love, I love Dr. Daryl's mineral powder. It's like a blood orange one. Um, I think you can use code skinny too. And then I love the the um, the water and wellness minerals that come in a little Kenton minerals. Yeah, that come in a glass vial. Which, by the way, you guys got to go listen to that episode. So it's a game changer. It's um, water and wellness. Just search that or Dr. Robert Slowback on our episode because it's it's great stuff. Yeah, and I put that in my water always. So the the supplementation has been a big thing. The third thing that I think has made a huge difference in my postpartum recovery is lifting weights. I mean, I, I know Michael just said that, but lifting weights, that's another thing where I go and lift weights and I can tell my hormones are just like, ah, uh. like it's like it's like a breath of fresh air. Well, and again, we talk about this a lot on the show. I mean, I think it is finally more and more people are talking about the benefits of lifting weights and you have people coming on the show talking about it too. But I think so many women for so many years have been scared. They like think they're going to get bulky. Do you know how much weight you have to lift to get that bulkiness you're talking about? You, it's not easy to put on muscle, right? It's it's difficult. You have to lift a lot. And so well, I think also it's important to remember too, when you first start lifting weights, you do puff up a little bit. It's not that you puff up, you gain weight because muscle weighs more than fat. And so you people think, oh, I'm gaining weight, which is not a bad thing. It's a good weight that you're gaining because it burns fat. No, and the, I've seen it firsthand. And before I got pregnant, I, you know, saw it and I was transforming my body and then you got me pregnant. <laughs> And then I lifted weights the whole pregnancy and it was really like an outlet for me. Um, but it's like, you know, like the, the cardio is great. It's a good release, but it's, you have to do so much cardio. You're not going to get there and you, and you want to have the muscle tone. You want to have your body work for you. And also 
when you're lifting weights, like I said, it's such a mind body connection. So if you're in a place where you're a little foggy or you're feeling down or you're feeling stressed and you go and lift weights, it's immediately going to get you in the right headspace and make you feel better and get your endorphins flowing, which is obviously when you're postpartum and depressed, it's going to make you feel way better. I looking like looking back on my postpartum depression and how I feel now, it's a world of difference. And I think I think that a lot of mothers, they don't want to put themselves first because you have a brand new baby. But what I realized from my first experience is if I was feeling like I was in a fog all the time, I was not being the best mother that I could be. Like it's it's so much nicer to enjoy the baby when you feel clear. Well, it's funny because you'll talk about towns now and mention a bunch of things about how you know, this experience is compared to Zaza's. And I sometimes will have to remind you like, oh, this was either the same or this was completely different. I don't remember. Because you don't remember. And it's crazy because from my perspective, you're sitting there with the same person, but it's almost like there's like a glaze over the eyes and the, yeah. you, you can't, it's like you can't get through. Yeah, there was a there was a glaze over my eyes for a good, I would say a good eight months. Yeah, like for example, we were in this place when the in, it was kind of a crazy experience, but we were in this right before the pandemic started, we were in the desert in Palm Springs and we had this beautiful house with our friends and our baby was there and like we, parents came and all this. And I look back on that as one of the best times of our life. Right? And it was weird because it was right when the pandemic hit too and we got stuck out there for a while and like that was whole weird. And it was like a ghost town. And, but it was special because we had our dogs and we had our children and a couple of our friends and we were in this house and you look back on it as like one of the worst experiences of your life you, and you don't remember like all the great stuff that was going on then. Well, you look back on it as like this like tough experience and we all were having the greatest time of our life. Yeah. And I, I think that it, that it, it's even harder too when you like everything's like going your way and you still you still don't feel good. Um, and my thing with feeling good is when you have the right tools in your toolbox it's a game changer. It really is. And there's a lot of things people will say, oh my gosh, well, this is expensive. There's a lot of things you can do for free. Let me, let me give you some, some ideas. Okay. You can go outside every single morning and take a walk. That's free. You can wait and sit with yourself for 30 minutes every morning. That's free. You can take a freezing cold shower, right? You can go and get a freezing cold. I mean, you can go take a run. Well, that's, what There's a lot of things that you can do to get creative. What you're talking about is like, we unfortunately live in this like Band-Aid culture where something's going wrong and it's like, let's throw the Band-Aid on it. Let's let's see if there's a medicine we can take. Let's see if there's something we can do to fix it right now. There's a lot of, there, there should be, what we were just talking about checklists in the studio. There should be a checklist whenever you're feeling a certain kind of way. 100%. And in, in, listen, obviously depression, anxiety, postpartum are real issues, but there should be a checklist that people ask people and that the people get honest with themselves about before they go down to the Band-Aid solutions. Those could be, are you getting sunlight, getting outside? Are you taking a cold shower, a cold bath? Are you supplementing the best you can? Are you working out? Are you exercising? Are you better? Are all of these things. And if you're doing all of those things and you're being honest with yourself and it's still not working, then maybe you go to the other things, but don't just jump to the other things before you actually try to implement the things that are free. Yeah. And I think that if you're looking for an app that's really worked for me, there's this app called Habit. And what I do is I went and I did exactly what Michael's saying. I was like, okay, what are the things that I can do to feel my best every single day? And I'll give you some examples. Like one of them is read a book, stay off my phone for an hour in the morning, lemon mineral water, take an hour walk, uh, meditate, make the bed. So I, I just like listed, I probably listed like 40 things. They're not, I don't hit them every day. But the point is when I, when I do feel like I need a reset, I can go and I can see the habits visually and maybe I can hit five, maybe I can hit 10. And it's so cool because when you hit the habit, you just go in and you can just like check it off. See that, Michael? Mm -hmm. So, like I can just put, I read for 30 minutes this morning. I drank my lemon water. I stayed off the phone. I had my minerals, my greens. And it's just a way to like have that checklist and check in with yourself. I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to really be the best version and take care of yourself. I, I don't know where 
people will say, oh, I don't have time. You you make time for what's important. Wake up a half well, an listen, hour early. If you're, here's the thing. If you're listening to this show and you're getting irritated that we're constantly professing about how to be a better version or how to level up, then you're listening to the wrong fucking show. We're yeah, not, this isn't the right We're show. not the people that are like, oh, it's fine and you're okay. I don't want anybody that listens to this show to think that. I want you to be happy. I want you to be confident. I want you to feel good about yourself. But I want people to constantly realize that if they push harder and demand more of life, that they can continue to level up. I don't ever apologize for that. I, I was talking to my sister there at lunch and I said, I'm not competing with anybody on this planet but myself. I want to wake up every day, look myself in the mirror and say, am I better today than I was yesterday? From a business perspective, from a parenting perspective, from being a husband, all of these things, from a in shape, all whatever it is. That's my goal of life. I, I find that to be the most motivating thing in life is knowing that you can constantly get better. So I don't think that people should ever apologize for that message. That for, being- uh, for us, I think we live by the the method that Ed Milet always preaches, which is blissfully, sa- uh, how does it? Blissfully dissatisfied. Blissfully dissatisfied. So you're, you're like, for me, I always want to be better every single day. But what do they call? There was like that, you know, people were getting mad that there's like this, what, and we had a person on the show and we talked about this and it's like, it, it's something about like, not, you know, what, what, like it's like like raw raw culture like hyping people up or hustle they call it hustle culture or something like that I don't think that's the thing I think it's just like why why go through life being okay with staying the same I don't uh, hustle isn't the right word but for you know me what I'm saying? because I, because there you're reading this book about about energy I'm I'm very sensitive to knowing when I need to recharge like I'm all about recharging great hustle hustle when you got to hustle Today, today is a hustle. Like we've got back to back to back to back to back. But tomorrow I know will be an easier day to recharge. I just think that that I'm never going to apologize because I want to get better every day. Well, yeah. Well, and there's the other thing to distinguish. Like I don't care what better looks like for each individual. Like that could mean I want to get better in business or I want to be better in a relationship or I want to be in better shape. Like that doesn't matter. I just want people to think about improving themselves daily. Like it doesn't mean you win because you go make a bunch of money or you win because you have a six pack. I think it means you win because you're happy knowing that you're pushing and demanding the most out of whatever version of life you are looking for for yourself, right? I, I think the message of complacency is killing this country. It's killing this culture and it's killing our people, right? So you, the idea is that continue to push harder, continue to look for avenues where you can be happier, healthier, better, that is not a bad message and I'll never apologize for it. No. And I think holding yourself accountable is not a bad message. Oh God. Well, that's a, that's a whole nother thing. People don't like being held accountable. Well, I mean, <laughs> this probably isn't the right podcast though. If someone doesn't want to hold themselves accountable. No, my message is I want those people that, you know, want more out of life. I don't like, I'm not looking for the person that wants us to say everything's okay. It's not, you could always be better. Yeah. Well, that's what we're doing right now. Those are our wellness little tips and tricks that we're doing as parents. Um, I think the message of this for me is like, and I think you too, is like we've tried to eliminate distractions to focus on things that we can take it to the next level. And if this inspires you to do that a little bit more, great. We try to look at all life events that are challenging, parenting being one, as all the parents out there know. And instead of looking at it like, oh, you know, life's over. This is a challenge. We're never going to own time. We're never going to be alone. We're never going to be able to fuck with the door wide open anymore. We, right, right. You can make it happen. I don't want to scare any of our kids. But the point is, is you look at these experiences and say, okay, we can actually now start to demand more out of life and look at more ways to be happy, more ways to be productive, more ways to do things. Because if you constantly believe the narrative and believe the hype that this is the hardest thing, worst thing, I think that's what scares so many people off about cha- you know, taking that next step in life. No, you could look at it as like, this next life event is going to propel me to the next thing, to the next level. You can do it all. You really can do it all. This was so much fucking better than that first episode you tried to do. That was a whole mess. Well, I was post real postpartum. I was like, a- any woman who's listening that's had a baby will understand what I'm saying. I don't even need to explain it, actually. And by the way, everyone wants to know why we named Towns, Towns Call, Bostic. Well, I, I, we were really enjoy and we're obsessed with the name Towns. You know, shout out Towns Van Zandt, one of the greatest writers and singers of all time. Um, and then one of my favorite books of all time that my dad gave me, which Lauren, what do you, you're looking at me here? Weird. Have you read it yet? Yes. I've read about six chapters of it. Okay. So but you're, you're looking at me like I 
like I'm lying here. Lauren wants credit for the middle name. Okay, you can have credit for the name. Okay, you get it. But it was inspired by this book, Lonesome Dove. There's a guy named Woodrow Call in the book, one of my favorite characters of all time. And we like the name Call and also little TCB throwback to some Elvis. And yeah, Lauren, you know, we knew we knew we wanted a C. We and so we, we were like, what the is middle. the C? And you and towns had to be balanced because you can't, you know, you gotta be you gotta balance the name out. We're and big so, believers in balancing the names. If you yeah. have a name like Zaza, you can't have another crazy name following it. If you have a name like Towns, you have to have something that like blunts it a little bit or is yeah. calm after. See, yes, yes, yes. So we d- we did the name Call because when I was reading the book, I was like, this is literally the perfect name. And it is the perfect name for him. You want like eccentric and then simple or or vice versa. Yeah. A little... Michael Joseph. What was... Oh my God. My mom was probably at the altar praying when she named me. Mm. <laughs> Last time I went in a church, I went up in flames. Taylor, what's your middle name? Oh, his his middle name's No Mike on. Uh, all right. <laughs> Taylor um, No Mike on O'Connor. All right. Thank you, everybody. Taylor needs a checklist, O'Connor. <laughs> uh, you guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Make sure you are subscribed on iTunes. As always, we're going to do a little giveaway at the end. If you want to win a copy of my book, Get the Fuck Out of the Sun, all you have to do is tell us what you want to hear next on a solo episode. We love doing solo episodes on my latest Instagram at Lauren Bostic and follow me on TikTok. I'm on TikTok a lot. Did this episode make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, Let's see. All right. Thank you.